From CGTN headquarters in Beijing, this is The Hub with Wang Guan. Hello and welcome to The Hub. I'm Wang Guan in Beijing. The annual Central Economic Work Conference has just concluded. That is a very important meeting concerning China's economy, setting the tone for China's economy going forward. It's a challenging year for China's economy, to put it mildly. Uh, with the country's GDP slowing down in the third quarter to just 4.9 percent. And elsewhere in the world, the COVID variant is ravaging parts of the world. Uh, supply chain disruptions is happening, emerging with the, you know, as a major problem around the world. How should China and the world at this point find a way forward? and help the global economy recover. To discuss all of this, I'm very pleased to be joined today from Beijing by Jörg Utke, President of the European Union Chamber of Commerce in China. Mr. Utke, welcome to the Hub on CGTN. My first question is about China-EU trade. Uh, during a senior meeting between Chinese and the European Union officials, China's uh, Commerce Ministry senior official said uh, from the quarter one to quarter three, uh, China-EU trade actually achieved 600 billion. That is a significant increase year on year. What do you think accounted for that increase? Well, frankly, uh, it's a very lopsided increase. China just produces everything the world needs in a lockdown, be it medical equipment, uh, be it electronics. Uh, if you look into the data set, you see that actually month by month, uh, China's export into the European Union is growing between 35 and 40%. Whereas the imports from Europe into China actually are either 1% plus or 1% minus. So there is definitely a huge increase, but it's all due to the fact that Chinese exporters are incredibly uh, successful. And that shows that the European Union remains the market number one for China. Uh, yeah, right. Uh, because China, you know, uh, replaced other countries as uh, EU's largest trading partner in 2020. But you're talking about really a very important issue, you know, concerning European exporters. That is the trade deficit uh, for you guys, right? Um, what do you think explains the deficit? Why? Well, the deficit in itself is not bad. The U.S. can live with the deficit since uh, decades very comfortably. It all boils down to, you know, is it because of... Uh, uh, different market sizes, different market demand patterns, or is it because of market access uh, issues? Now, of course, Europe is very open for Chinese products, hence this kind of uh, incredible success story in uh, serve in goods. Uh, but at the same time, China remains more close. But, you know, bottom line is Europeans like Chinese products, and that's not a bad thing. And then uh, what do you make of China's, uh, you know, pledges of opening its, uh, you know, markets? And for example, we do see some opening happening in the financial services sector and agriculture sector, for example. Uh, do you see that and policy, you know, manifestations, statements like that potentially impacting, you know, trade between the EU and China going forward? Well, 20 years ago, China joined the WTO, and I must say, you know, I, I witnessed that, and I've been part of this journey. We founded the European Chamber because of this. Uh, as China was opening up, we thought we could chip in our knowledge and provide recommendations. And of course, the, the leapfrogging of reforms was staggering in the first 10 years. But over the last 10 years, we have seen baby steps in opening up. And again and again, we basically hear the word opening up. Uh, we even call it uh, promise fatigue. So yes, China makes openings in the logistics, in the financial markets, uh, but still, to us at least, uh, very small. So the Chinese market is developing incredibly fast, but it's not that we can always play along with this. So how do you see COVID as a factor impacting trade between the two sides? Well, again, uh, China produces exactly the products that uh, Europe or the world needs uh, in a lockdown modus, uh, meaning it is uh, uh, electronics, uh, uh, it is textiles, it is uh, also medical equipment. Um, so in a way, China has been a beneficiary economically uh, from that. At the same time, of course, everyone suffers from the kind of mess we're in in logistics. Containers getting stuck at ports, uh, piling up. Uh, we have lockdowns on short notice also in China, uh, where, for example, Ningbo port went down uh, just because of one case. So disruptions on the logistics sides actually drive costs up and make life for exporters and importers very difficult. But overall, I think uh, uh, given circumstances, I think the economies of Europe and China did actually cope well with the COVID challenge. Let's talk about investment. As we all know, the Comprehensive Agreement on Investment, uh, otherwise known as CAI, has been stuck. Uh, this time last year, the two sides agreed in principle 
about this historic uh, investment deal, but uh, the EU Parliament uh, froze this deal. Um, do you see that deal still happening? And if so, when? I don't see it happening anytime soon. Uh, Europe started with sanctions and uh, China retaliated with outside sanctions, which unfortunately uh, was covering five parliamentarians. Uh, and this European Parliament has to approve this deal. Uh, as there is no way out at this stage, at least I don't see it, how easing uh, would help, how this kind of de-escalation of sanctions would help. I think we're stuck uh, uh, that the investment agreement is not going to happen anytime soon, though we would wish uh, that it's going to happen. But it doesn't matter. The growth is there. Uh, the investment opportunities are also there. It's a missed opportunity, but uh, life goes on. Yeah, I mean, uh, talking about missed opportunities, uh, Businessmen hate uh, the fact that uh, politics gets in the way of economics. Uh, people hate, uh, for example, geopolitical rivalry, major power politics. But let's face it, uh, it is happening. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the CAI is uh, frozen uh, for, you know, uh, largely a political reason. Um, but in principle, how do you see this deal, the CAI, uh, potentially helping and contributing to, you know, increased investment? of the two sides? Well, it was a small step. If you read the CAI, actually after seven years of negotiations, it was a very thin soup, but it was a nutritious soup nonetheless. And uh, we had more openings in the car industry. We had more openings in the healthcare sector. We had a dispute settlement mechanism all of a sudden. It was good for Chinese investors in Europe, very important in order not to run into political headwinds. So all in all, it was not bad. And, you know, business likes to get things done. We like to not have the uncertainty of a looming trade agreement somewhere. We wanted to have facts. Unfortunately, we had the facts and 12 weeks later, they are in the freezer. But again, you know, we, we are dusting ourselves off and, and keep going. Um, and uh, we have to just see that with our recommendations, the European Chamber, we are also actively trying to contribute uh, to reform efforts in the Chinese government. And I was lucky and privileged enough in order to move on Minister Wang in October to outline this. So there is a good, uh, good dialogue going on between business and the Chinese government on where actually we can do things without waiting too long for the investment agreement. Uh, Mr. Utke, uh, talking about uh, you know, a two-way street, many European companies are doing exceedingly well. And many point out the fact that Mercedes-Benz, a German car company, for example, uh, have co-production uh, in, here in China, and they're selling very well in the Chinese market. Well, there are two dimensions of our economic relationship. One is trade, uh, where, again, uh, China is selling twice as much to Europe as does Europe to China. So there's definitely a lot of room uh, for improvement. As a matter of fact, six years ago, European Union companies sold more into Switzerland than into the People's Republic of China. But of course, the big success story is the investment over here, uh, the cars, the chemicals, the machinery and so forth, where China has been opening fast. Manufacturing has been the area where we could access the market rather easily. And hence, uh, we have been very successfully uh, contributing to the economic de development of this country. So in a way, uh, if you look into the data set, uh, European companies are contributing with other foreign companies. For example, in Shanghai, 30% of tax income. So it's not just that we are successful, we also make the locations where we are based successful. But don't you think, uh, in a way, that says a lot about uh, the size of the Chinese market and also uh, you know, the ability, the capability of Chinese manufacturers? Because last time I checked with some of my business friends, uh, like you pointed out, uh, they have their cargo trains piling up in their tens of thousands at the border with Kyrgyzstan, you know, uh, at the Xinjiang-Kazakh border. Uh, the, the, you know, they cannot simply export because uh, there are too many of them. Well, the, the train export indeed gets stuck. It's difficult, uh, uh, but you have to put it in perspective. Every train has about 50 containers. There are 7,000 trains going per year into Europe mostly full, coming back virtually half empty. Um, and 35,000 containers you can put on two ships from Costco. So it's all relative. I mean, the real problem for us is the problems we have in Chinese and European harbors, where also the uh, containers are piling up. But that's far more significant. The train, as a matter of fact, is just 0. Point something percent of our trade engagement. OK, President Woodge, uh, let me ask you this. Um, you know, we do a lot of uh, shows on international politics, so I'm really tempted to ask you this question. The EU 
uh, designated China as three things, a, a cooperative partner uh, in some fields, a, a competitor uh, in technology and other fields, a systemic rival. You know, when I asked uh, Nicolas Chapuy, uh, he said the, the rival is not such a bad word in Chinese. It should not be uh, 敌人. It should be something less uh, severe, uh, less alarming. Uh, do you agree? I mean, um, it looks like the EU have very conflicting feelings about what China is to them. Well, it's not really conflicting if you just outline as it is. You know, I mean, we are definitely partners, good partners. We are competitors, particularly not only in our respective markets, but also in third country markets. And rivalry is systemic, it's just where we come from. We have a totally different political system than China, and every decent communist knows that the dialectical struggle is in the cards. Systemic rivalry should not be unknown in China itself. So it's just a matter of fact. It's just how we deal with this, how fair and square we actually overcome this and not hurt each other. That's more important. Fact is, I think the three uh, areas are not only reflecting Europeans' attitude towards China, but also could be viewed as China's attitude on Europe. I mean, talking about the EU is not a monolithic whole, right? Uh, it consists of so many countries across the ideological, political, uh, economic, and uh, developmental spectrum. Um, personally, I mean, you've been living in China for so many years, uh, and uh, as a European, how do you see uh, the EU's relations with China going forward. Do you think it will be uh, as one that is defined by rivalry, as many would uh, predict, between the China and the U.S., uh, when, it talk, when it comes to China and the EU? Well, I came to this country 40 years ago for the first time, by the way, by train. Uh, and I must say I've witnessed the economic miracle in, in not only domestic development, also with the cooperation between Europe and China, not just in trade, in art, uh, in many other areas. Uh, and it has always been an up and better and deeper. Uh, I'm a bit dismayed about the recent developments of more confrontations and sanctions and threats, which I think is really disheartening. As you pointed out before, business doesn't like it. We don't want to be politicized. So if you ask me where we're heading, uh, I hope that actually we've, we reach a status of uh, 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 status quo, that we have a situation where actually things don't get worse. We stop having sanctions imposed on each other. I hope, for example, we, we experience the Olympics as a wonderful uh, sports event and not a political battlefield. And then we have to see small steps where we can agree upon. Climate change, for example, is one thing where we definitely have to work together. Biodiversity, there's enough stuff out there where we don't have to have confrontations. Uh, how do you look at the, the, you know, Washington's boycott of 2022 Beijing Olympics? Well, frankly, I think it's a pretty empty gesture. Nobody invited them. They are not coming here. Three weeks of quarantine. You know, it's easy to boycott something which you didn't want to attend in the first place. And then finally, uh, what do you see as the biggest growth sectors between China and the EU going forward? Well, I guess it's really in, in climate change related issues. It's technologies, it's software, it's artificial intelligence uh, in order to actually help us uh, to achieve carbon neutrality in China 2060 earlier in Europe. Uh, European companies are well placed in order to showcase how they can reach uh, carbon neutrality. Uh, that's actually really an area where I think we can cooperate quite well. And then frankly, China is the fastest aging society in the world due to the one, China pol uh, one child policy. Uh, so I guess there's a lot of uh, potential in rehabilitation, in medicine, in healthcare, uh, and so on and so on. No, I mean, the, the area where we can cooperate is vast uh, and uh, we benefit, but you know, there's always this interference from politics. President Jörg Wutke, President of the European Union Chamber of Commerce in China, thank you for joining The Hub on CGTN. Thank you, thank you. You've been watching The Hub on CGTN. Stay tuned, we have more to come after the break. Welcome back to The Hub. Days ago, the British Chamber of Commerce in China released a survey on business sentiment in China. It shows that half of UK companies have seen earnings exceeding pre-pandemic levels. For more on that and on the Chinese economy, we have with us today in Beijing, Mr. Stephen Lynch, Managing Director for the British Chamber of Commerce in China. Uh, Mr. Lynch, great to have you here on The Hub on CGTN. Uh, first of all, I'm just curious about this report. Um, what do you see as the most important findings of this survey? 
So this is the fourth British business uh, in China sentiment survey that we've conducted here in China. We have about 288 companies that have responded from the FTSE 100 companies right the way down to dynamic startups. And I suppose it's there's lots of good news within the report, but there's also some concerning issues that we that we kind of, of course. are you know are, are worried about. Um, I suppose let's start with, with the, the with the with the positives. Unsurprisingly, um, optimism has improved from uh, 2020 when we were at the height of the uh, the COVID-19 pandemic here in China, and we're seeing revenue levels increase um, from 2020, and that's been backed up by. Uh, investment through to 2022. We're seeing more British businesses investing into the China market, and that's largely due to market potential. Like 82% have said it's all due to, to, to market potential. So that's that's really positive. On the other side, we're seeing some concerning issues that three-fifths of business have said it actually got harder to do business here in China, and they're still facing significant challenges. Hiring foreign talent has leapfrogged all other issues for British businesses here in China, uh, leapfrog long-standing issues around cybersecurity um, and implementations of law and regulations. Now, why is this mobility issue so concerning? I think, unsurprisingly, uh, mobility will be a problem, um, you know, around the world at a time like this. But one of the concerns for us is around the people-to-people -people engagement. This underhinges everything um, around the bilateral and multilateral aspects of, of China uh, engagement with the world. So, if we sort of if we prohibit some of this travel in this this people-to-people -people engagement, you know, this is not going to be a tap that we can just turn back on in two or three years. You know, we genuinely risk losing a generation of, you know, China advocates, of, of people who are engaged with China on the ground here. So we, lose, we risk losing a generation of advocates for the bilateral relationship. So that's one of the big concerns for us is, is mobility and the, the existence to bring in foreign nationals into the China market. And that's been a dramatic change from the last year's sentiment survey. Right, Stephen, so are you mostly referring to China's, you know, zero, basically zero tolerance policy for COVID, um, largely restricting, limiting foreign nationals, um, businessmen doing, you know, business coming over to China? Yes, exactly. So I think um, on one hand, China should absolutely be commended um, for their incredible, uh, co you know, zero COVID-19 policy. And I think you know, that robust COVID-19 uh, policy has allowed to very strong economic recovery. So we're absolutely not saying we want to bypass quarantine measures. We don't want to bypass, you know, any of the health care or the COVID tests. But what we are looking for is certainty. You know, the UK does not have direct flights to China. We're still hearing from our members that they're having issues around getting visas, uh, getting visas for high skilled talent to come to China. We're having issues around dependence coming into China. So on no aspect are we saying we want to we want to bypass the quarantines or bypass what China is doing. What we want is certainty. We want to be able to have safe, pragmatic travel mechanisms to come to and to and from China. And I think at a time like this um, for, the, for the UK, where we are seeing lots of people looking at the next year, that there is no certainty that they can come and go from China. We're seeing a lot of people looking to leave the country and they're not being replaced. And I think that is our biggest concern around hiring foreign talent and mobility coming in and out of China. Yeah, I have some British friends here in China and uh, expats uh, for that matter. And, uh, you know, they've been talking about uh, their dependents and not being able to make the trip over to China. Um, but looking at the survey that is called British Business in China Sentiment Survey, the survey, as you pointed out, uh, in that 52% of UK companies are actually optimistic about the outlook in the Chinese market. Why do you think that is the case? Well, this is largely due, uh, due to China's economic recovery, due to COVID-19. As I, as I mentioned, you know, China should be commended for, for their zero tolerance policy on one aspect. You know, that has meant that the environment uh, can, can flourish uh, in that aspect. So a huge part of this is, is down to China's market potential, market opportunities. Uh, here in China, you know, a lot of the businesses have been here for over 40 years, you know, they're really committed here in market. Um, so again, you know, we're, we're seeing this optimism coming through, we're seeing optimism, optimism, optimism level, sorry, uh, pick back up um, from 2020. And we're seeing that being backed up by investment, you know, we've also seen lots of, um, you know, positive engagement around the bilateral relationship uh, in the last few weeks and the last few months. Uh, and that's been highlighted uh, by a Boris Johnson, our prime minister, having a call with Xi Jinping. You know, that's an incredibly positive step uh, moving forward. So, again, I, I think there is, there's lots of optimism here in market. There's lots of opportunities. 
Um, of course, this sentiment survey looks at some of the, the market access barriers, the business environment, but we also highlight some of the incredible opportunities between the UK and China. And again, there is lots of opportunities moving forward into 2022. All right, we know that uh, a policy matters in China and uh, many you know, uh, people who are China observers are watching very closely China's uh, senior most uh, leaders meetings. Uh, recently, China had a meeting between November, uh, December the 8th until the 10th. It is called uh, you know, the Central Economic Work Conference uh, held by the Politburo of the CPC. Um, what's your takeaway from the meeting about China's economy going forward? Well, I think my, 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 my takeaway is that there's just huge potential and there's huge opportunities to collaborate uh, and move, move forward together. Again, when we, when we talk about unlocking some of these market access barriers, we're doing this in the interest of both our nations and both our nations to have this win-win collaboration. Um, so I think there's so many complementary areas in which the UK and China and the UK and Europe um, can, can work together and, and strengthen ties. Again, I look at sort of the... the, the the, the footprint that the UK has in China here, and it's a high value added services. You know, our strength lies in professional um, and financial services, which again is an area in which China is looking to develop and looking to strengthen. Mm -hmm. So these are really key areas that we can absolutely collaborate on together. And again, you know, looking at the, the, the recent meeting that took place, um, and again, if we look back to just a few weeks ago, a few months ago, um, back in the UK, we had COP26 and we had COP15 here in China. This is a huge area around net zero, around decarbonization, that the UK and China have complementary services, complementary industries that can work together. So again, I look at that meeting with optimism. Um, there are certainly issues that we must address, but these are real opportunities as well looking forward. We know that uh, from the survey, half of the UK companies have seen earnings exceeding pre-pandemic levels. That means still a large amount of the, the a large portion of the UK companies in China uh, have not seen their earnings exceeding pre-pandemic levels. Also in this report, 46% uh, are saying that they're increasing investment in China, but 39% uh, there will be no change, and 7% say they will actually decrease investment. Um, can you give us a breakdown uh, you know, when it comes to sectors and industries? Which sectors uh, are the British companies, exporters, uh, investors particularly interested in working with China and the Chinese market? Well, it's great. You know the numbers better than me, so thank you very much for that. That's my team. And what we're seeing, <laughs> uh, the, the sort of what we've seen from, from the data is uh, a fragile recovery. There is there's still a long way for certain businesses uh, on the road to recovery. But again, as I mentioned, we are seeing these optimism levels increase. So some of the areas uh, where we're delighted to see improvement, um, retail consumer goods, um, we've seen opening up in the financial service sector. Um, you know, these are all really positive uh, movements and we're seeing you know that being backed up by investment we're seeing some of the issues uh, be addressed some of the long-standing issues be addressed and that's going to be that's going to be you know further improved by by further investment into the market not to you know that's to say not every sector is seeing this optimism we've obviously seen unsurprisingly um, issues around the hospitality around travel around leisure uh, and indeed education and again a big footprint of UK businesses here in China is education um, and again, they, that's the sector that's seeing the biggest disruption um, around mobility, around high level talent coming into the country, not to mention also the uncertainty around sort of regulations coming in as well. So again, we're calling a fragile recovery from the British business perspective. We're still not quite at pre-pandemic levels, but in many aspects, we're seeing recovery. And that's, that's a really positive step moving forward. Right. Uh, and then how do you see geopolitical tensions, uh, namely uh, China-US rivalry, uh, impacting businesses and supply chains? So I think so. One of, this is one of the questions we directly asked our businesses, you know, are you being impacted uh, specifically on the UK side, so the UK-China relationship? And half of businesses said that they are concerned. They are concerned about the, the relationship between UK and China. But we asked this question last year, and it's had a 10% decrease of concern, which is, again, a very, very positive step in the right direction. As previously mentioned, we've seen lots of high-level bilateral engagement um, in the last few weeks. Uh, we've seen, again, I go back to Xi Jinping having the call with, with Boris Johnson. We've seen ministers, our health minister, Ma, having a, a conversation with Savid Javid, um, Alok Sharma, the COP26 president, came here to China. So again, you know, it is a concern. Of course, it's, um, you know, people, members have said, but again, it's moving in the right direction. Um, and I think that's, that's kind of the critical aspect um, for our members. 
Right, right. Um, in that report, it says there is a quote unquote continued concern among the business community as to the lack of a consistent approach taken towards working with China. Uh, what exactly does that mean? Well, again, from, from, from the information that our members have provided, the key is uncertainty. You know, uncertainty around any aspect of business is, is a risk. And so what, again, members and businesses are calling for is just more certainty in every single aspect of this. We've obviously seen new regulations um, come, come out here in China. Um, and again, people are maybe not disagreeing with the actual regulations, just how they've been implemented. Um, the, the very dramatic nature or the fast nature of them coming through causes issues of how businesses can handle uh, you know, regulations or new laws being implemented. So it's clarity around the new laws, around the regulations, and then how they're implemented. And I think that filters down into every single aspect of what businesses is looking for. And it's all around, it's all around certainty. Right, you talk about education, uh, Stephen. I'm asked by many parents uh, watching our program and here in China, whether they should uh, consider the UK or the US for you know, uh, you know, furthering their education experiences. Um, what will be your answer to that question? Well, I would hope so. I think the UK has a phenomenal um, education system, whether that be at school or indeed at university. And again, the, the UK is open. The UK is, a, is an open market. We, we are delighted to welcome foreign students into the country. And again, we have one of the best education systems in the world. So I, you know, I would encourage as, you know, people to, to engage. And I, I think, you know, when we talk about why it's so important to go to each other's countries and, and study and be educated, it's because we, we gain that cultural knowledge of each other. And I think that's so important. That underpins all of our relationships. The people to people, the cultural engagement is absolutely critical. So I would welcome more students uh, from the UK to come here to China and indeed students going back to the UK as well. Stephen Lynch, Managing Director for the British Chamber of Commerce here in China. Uh, thank you for joining us on The Hub on CGTN. Thank you very much. And that would do it for this edition of The Hub. Thank you for watching. I'm Wang Guan in Beijing. Get in touch with me on social media if you have any comments or suggestions. Bye for now.